My favorite lunch day in elementary school wasn't Pizza Fridays, it wasn't Taco Tuesday, or Chicken Nugget Thursday. No, it was the random, magical days when the school cafeteria staff would buck all national school lunch nutritional standards and sell any kid a half-quart styrofoam cup of buttery mashed potatoes for 50 cents. The humble, immediate appeal of mashed potatoes is easy to understand. The science of the spud, though? That's a bit more complicated. There are over 4,000 varieties of potatoes in the world, but at most supermarkets, you find just a handful. All potatoes are made up of primarily two components, water and starch. The amount and type of starch a potato contains has a big impact on its cooked texture. We could break all potatoes down into basically three categories based on the amount of starch they contain. These are low starch, moderate starch, and high starch. Red Bliss and French Fingerling potatoes live in the low starch group. Yukon Gold sit in the middle with a moderate amount of starch, and russet potatoes, they're up in the high starch group. And the starch differences can be pretty significant. Russets contain about 25% more starch than Red Bliss potatoes. You can actually see these differences in density by dropping potatoes into an 11% salt solution. Less starchy, and therefore less dense Red Bliss potatoes will float, dense, starchy russets will sink, and if you choose the right specimen, a Yukon Gold potato will actually sit right in the middle. That's pretty cool. All of the starch occurs within the cells of potatoes as microscopic granules. Think of the cells as boxes and the granules as balloons within those boxes. When the potatoes are cooked, the granules absorb water from within the potato and swell up. The balloons get bigger. All of these expanding balloons can cause the cells that contain them to expand, separate, and burst. With continued cooking, the starch balloons themselves can expand so much that they burst, eventually releasing starch. In low starch potatoes, like a Red Bliss, the cells contain fewer of these balloons, so they're less likely to rupture. These potatoes remain intact and absorb less liquid from their environment. On the other hand, in high starch potatoes, like a russet, the cells contain lots and lots of starch balloons. This causes the cells to burst much more readily during cooking, creating a fluffier, crumblier texture. You can see these differences in absorption by cooking cubes of each type of potato in water that is dyed deep blue. Check it out. The dye travels deep into the russet cubes, while it only forms a thin blue line around the exterior of the red bliss cubes. But that's not the whole story. The amount of starch definitely matters, but so does the type of starch. There are two types of starch molecules, amylose and amylopectin. Amylose are simple linear molecules that twist and turn like a roller coaster. An amylopectin molecule, on the other hand, looks like the overhead view of the streets of Boston, a nightmare of intersecting one ways with terrible signage that branch out in all directions with no hint of logic in sight. Sorry, I kind of a bad commute this morning. Anyway, these two types of molecules produce potatoes with very different textures. Amylose molecules are very long and bind up loads of water, resulting in a potato that is dry and floury in texture. Amylopectin molecules bind up much less water. The free water that they leave behind leads to a potato with a moist, smooth texture. All this information is really helpful in picking out the best spud for the best mashed potatoes. So let's go to the kitchen. I have three fully cooked potatoes in front of me that I've sliced in half. I'm gonna press on them and look how differently they react. The Red Bliss stays together with a smooth consistency. It's the lowest in those starch balloons, so its cells remain intact. And it has the highest ratio of amylopectin, so it has a moist, smooth texture. Both the Yukon Gold and the Russet fracture when I press on them, and the Russet fractures the most. If a potato fractures like this, it's going to be a great spud for mashing, because it's gonna be able to absorb lots of flavorful liquid. Save those creamy, smooth Red Bliss for either boiling or roasting. There are many ways to make mashed potatoes, but there are five keys to doing it well. First, cut the potato into even pieces. I find slices to be better than cubes because they're faster to cut and they cook evenly. Next, start in cold, well-salted water. If you add potatoes to boiling water, the exterior will overcook and slough off before the interior is cooked through. A cold start ensures nice, even cooking. Now, simmer your potatoes, don't boil them. All of these changes I've been talking about happen at temperatures well below the boiling point of water. So, not only is that extra heat unnecessary, it can actually overcook the exterior of the potato while the interior cooks through. And that violent movement of boiling water can actually physically break up the potatoes. Then, drain the potatoes and return the pot to low heat. For the smoothest possible mash, pass the potatoes through a ricer back into that warmed pot. That additional heat will help drive off flavorless water, allowing us to add even more flavorful liquid. Finally, add your fat first. The starch that gets released when those starch balloons burst can create a gluey, sticky network, especially if we over stir the potatoes. By adding the fat first, we can coat some of that starch and prevent them from getting gluey as we stir. For Little Kid Dan, I'm adding lots of butter and salt. And for Big Kid Dan, I'm adding a sprinkle of chives. This 
is how to eat mashed potatoes. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Let me know what kind of mashed potatoes are gonna end up on your holiday table in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe.